Madam President. Senator from Florida. I want to start by talking about Ukraine. We have a lot of different opinions here on it, and uh, so I wanted to take a moment and discuss this issue of Ukraine, because there's been a lot of talk about it. I've been watching, you know, there's been a, as the senator from Kentucky just pointed to a moment ago, there's been a lot of debate and uh, over the last five days about the topic of Ukraine. Let me, I want to set the st stage for why what's happening in Ukraine happened. But let me f just first preface it by saying what is happening there is not irrelevant to this country and certainly not unimportant. So to set the stage, you know, we've got to go back a little bit. In 2014, Vladimir Putin actually invaded Ukraine. He didn't admit it was his people. He sent in these special forces. They were d dressed in costumes. He pretended that wasn't his people, but it was. And, and, the, and the, the rationale was, if you want to go back for a moment with history about Ukraine, Ukraine was supposed to join, wanted to join Europe. There was this push inside of Ukraine to join the European Union and to become European in its um, orientation. Putin didn't like it and began threatening and pressuring the then president of Ukraine. The then president of Ukraine, under that pressure from Putin, backed down. Upon backing down, he faced a fierce public resistance to that decision. And as a result of that, the then president of Ukraine ordered security forces into the street to attack protesters and, um, and crack down. Those protesters eventually overwhelmed the government, overthrew that government, basically. The president had to flee under the auspices of Vladimir Putin's protection. And then Putin decided to take what they call little green men, because they weren't dressed like regular Russian military, and some of the separatist groups, again, supported by Vladimir Putin to seize portions of Ukrainian national territory. In addition, the Russians did send their troops dressed in these little green men costumes to take a portion called Crimea. And there's several reasons why that was important to them. The first is obviously access to the ocean, access to the sea and for the Navy and so forth. And the other is because Crimea is actually a has been historically a pretty uh, vibrant and profitable tourism site. So it, they believed it would add to their economy as well. They even went as far as to conduct a fake referendum, a fake election, uh, in which the people of Crimea allegedly voted to join the Russian Federation. And that was the status quo beginning around this time of 2014, up until the invasion that began um, and uh, almost, two, over, almost two years now. And there was this line of demarcation that was between the separatist forces backed by Putin and the Ukrainian military, and they faced off and there were skirmishes and the like. And then Putin decided to invade. Why did Putin decide to invade? Well, Putin, I am confident, was told by his people Two things. The first thing he was told is that in the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine, he would be greeted as a liberator, that people will come out into the streets holding up roses and greet the Russians as liberators. They wanted to be a part of Russia. The second thing he was told is that Ukraine would collapse, that Zelensky and the leadership in Kyiv would abandon the country. And they truly believed, the Russians, Putin, honestly and truly believed that within a week, 10 days, they wouldn't conquer all of, of, of Ukraine, but they would certainly conquer much of it. And a friendly puppet government would be installed in Kyiv. They would at least cut the country in half, if not more so, and bring it under the Russian orbit. I point to Belarus as an example. Belarus is theoretically its own independent country, but their leaders do nothing without Vladimir Putin. In fact, when Vladimir Putin decided that he was going to station troops and nuclear weapons in Belarus, Belarus didn't have the right to say, no, we don't want you to do that. You can't do that here. They had to do it. And that's sort of how he envisioned this rump state that he was trying to carve out. So that was the thinking that he had. It's, by the way, one of the things that these authoritarian regimes suffer from. In these authoritarian regimes, no one wants to tell the leader that they're wrong. No one wants to tell them they're wrong, so they're always telling you whatever you want to hear. The other reason why they tell you what you want to hear is because that's the stuff that gets paid attention to. The leaders... If you want your memo, if you want your intelligence product, if you want your advice and counsel to be listened to in an authoritarian government, then you're going to generally 
produce things that that person's going to like. You want to confirm their pre-existing biases. And Putin honestly believed that Ukraine desperately belonged to Russia, belonged, wanted to be with Russia, and that the Russian military was so powerful they would be able to sweep in and take them out. Well, it didn't work that way. Zelensky did not abandon Kyiv. The Ukrainian people did not greet them as liberators, and they resisted. And it's important to remember, they resisted before the flood of American aid and European aid went into Ukraine. Ukrainians were resisting, and they were fighting. And the Russians suffered enormous casualties early in the war when Ukraine wasn't even well armed. These are tough people with dignity, and they did not want to be a part of Russia and the Russian Federation. They still do not. That sets the stage for what we face today. We don't have time today, even with the hour that I have to speak and everything else, to go into all the depths of history the way, for example, you know, Putin went on some tirade for 30 minutes in some interview last week with all these weird historical references about why Ukraine belongs to Russia and so forth. Suffice it to say that uh, the history is complex. In fact, many Soviet leaders came from the Ukraine region, but it does not belong to the Russian Federation. It is a country that wants to be independent of Russia, with a substantial percentage of its population that wants to be Western-oriented. And Putin does not want a Western-oriented country that's not under his control on his border. And so he decided he was going to make Ukraine a rump state, but it didn't work out that way. So people do ask me, and the previous speaker, the junior senator from Kentucky a moment ago was discussing this, people do wonder, like, okay, that's terrible what happened. Why is that our business? And I've heard a lot of talk here today, and so I think it's important that we bring a little bit of nuance and balance to this conversation. On the one hand, it is not true that this issue is completely unimportant. It's not true. It is important. Why is it in our national interest? There are a number of issues why we should care about what's happening in Ukraine beyond just feeling sympathy for the people there. And there's a reason why, for example, uh, what we give here can't be zero. Let me begin with one of the reasons why we care. The first is because if the Russian Federation is, would have been successful, if Putin had been successful in taking Ukraine or dividing Ukraine in half, it would set the, it would completely unravel what's going on in many other parts of the world. You see, for better, for worse, and I think for better, for the better part of the last 20, 30, 40 years, there's been a general acknowledgement for the, for the most part that you can't just invade another country and take land away from them because you want it. That's what started World War II as an example. You can't do that. And what regulated that was a series of things. NATO in, in Europe, our alliances in the Indo-Pacific, um, the ability of countries to defend themselves, the condemnation of the international community, no one wanted to be a pariah. The bottom line is that for, for much, much of human history, up until you know, the last 80 years, but for much of human history was basically defined by leaders that decided, we really like that land, we really want that land, and we're going to go take that land because our army is more powerful than yours. In fact, if you just sit down and read history at all, at all of the great historic figures, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, they were all conquerors. They were all people that basically, their greatness came not necessarily because of something great they did for the world or some extraordinary advances in their society, although some of them did have advances in their society, but largely their fame, their repute, they're judged by empire building by a desire to conquer as much land and territory as possible. And it defined virtually all of the famous and great civilizations, for the most part, that we know about in human history. But after the Second World War, the world sort of got together and said, we don't want to live in a world like that anymore. And we created not just rules and laws at the international stage to govern it, but we also created defense alliances to prevent it. But what would happen now if suddenly Russia was able to go in, take Ukraine just because, carve it up into a rump state, maybe there'd be a little sliver of Ukraine left, but the core of the country would have been pulled into the... That, imagine they would have been able to do it to Ukraine what they did to a part of Ukraine in Crimea. Other countries would be watching. There are dozens of territorial disputes going on in the world right now as we speak. And they range from disputes between China and India on their border, disputes with China and its claims on Taiwan ranges from that to in our own hemisphere, where even as we are here gathered now and late at night talking about these things, Venezuela and its Maduro dictatorship has decided 
that land that belongs to Guyana actually belongs to Venezuela. Now, obviously, there are some rare earth minerals there and some really important materials, and there's, they've good, they discovered a lot of oil. And Venezuela's threatening those oil rigs. They're threatening that exploration. But that's a territorial dispute right here, right in our region. So if we live in a world where you can just go in, invade a country, take it, and nothing happens except maybe a resolution condemning you at the UN, and you get away with it, other countries are going to do the same. And before you know it, we are going to be living in a world in which war is literally breaking out in every corner over territorial disputes. So that in and of itself is of concern. Because the United States is too powerful, too big a country. Our economy, our daily lives are deeply intertwined with things that are happening all over the world. We may not realize it. We may have taken it for granted. But things that are happening halfway around the world have direct impact on our everyday life. Right now, the Houthis, a band of basically rebels, guerrillas, pirates, religious zealots. But unfortunately, Iran has provided for them guided munitions and weapons and long-range rockets with, that are able to hit tankers. And so today, and people are going to start to feel it soon, you will be paying more for a lot of things, particularly potentially oil and fuel, because the insurance rates on shipping through the Red Sea is skyrocketing, particularly for vessels flagged by America or American allies. So the insurance rate on the shipping goes up, prices go up. For you, what's happening halfway around the world. Just one example. So what happens around the world does matter. And if war starts to break out in different parts of the world, you'll feel it in your pocketbook, you'll feel it in your security, you'll feel it in migration threats, you'll face it in all of this. We should care just because of that. Imagine, for example, if you're sitting in Beijing right now, you're watching Ukraine very closely. What happens when you move on? What happens when the United States and much of the rest of the world says to you, we're warning you, do not do it, and you do it? What happens? Do they sanction you for a few months? Do they maybe provide weaponry for, for that country, but then after a few years sort of give up and become fatigued and walk away? Because if Russia with an economy a fraction of the size of China, is able to weather sanctions and military support for Ukraine, China's calculating we can certainly weather whatever the United States and other countries are going to throw at us the day we decide we're going to invade Taiwan. Very dangerous situation. So it matters because of that. The second reason why it matters to us, and I'll talk about more about this in a moment, is you know our reputation does matter. It does, and it doesn't matter as a, as, for, as a matter of pride. It matters with real consequence. So right now, the Chinese in particular, but others, go around the world and are openly saying the following. Openly. I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm paraphrasing for purposes of understanding this. But basically, the Chinese message to the world is America is a once great power in decline. Their society is hollowed out. Don't you watch television? Don't you see the videos and the images of everything terrible that's going on in America right now? And their government is dysfunctional, and their society is turned upside down, and their kids are killing themselves, and their people are drug addicted. America's falling apart, and America's unreliable. Completely, America's unreliable. They didn't just see what they did in Afghanistan. And if suddenly, we decide we're done with Ukraine, they'll point to Ukraine and say, this is what happens to American allies. They are with you until they lose interest and they'll walk away. And so it begins to undermine a system of alliances, which really is the one big advantage we have over the Chinese. The Chinese don't really have any global alliances. The Chinese has no alliances anywhere in the world. The United States has an alliance system whose value cannot be quantified. You can't put a dollar figure on it. It's so valuable, you can't even quantify it. That alliance system would be deeply threatened if all of a sudden the United States, after about two years, decided we're done with Ukraine, we're walking away, we're done with it. The damage would be quite significant. So it does matter. It matters. There's a, there's a national interest involved in Ukraine. Now, I want to address, I've also heard some hyperbole, because I think when you make public policy, 
you have to balance things. You have to determine to yourself, okay, if this matters, how much does it matter? And your investment and commitment must be commensurate to your national interest. I love to believe in ideals. I love to believe in idealism. But frankly, foreign policy is the work of pragmatism. Rarely in foreign policy do we get a choice between the perfect and the terrible. Oftentimes in foreign policy, we get two very bad choices. And we're trying to figure out which one of the two is the least worst for our country. And so it's important to have a little balance here. And I'm very confident in everything I'm about to tell you, based on the amount of time I spend on these things and so forth. The first is, no matter what, if tomorrow we were to walk away, and I'm not arguing that we should, but if tomorrow we were to walk away and give Ukraine not a dollar more, not a penny more, not a weapon more, the Russian Federation would not be able to take all of Ukraine. They couldn't from the very beginning, and they can't now. Would they be able to make gains beyond what they hold now? Maybe, probably, a little bit. But they would never be able to take the entirety of the country. If they couldn't do it back before we were helping Ukraine, if they couldn't do it back when their military still had capabilities they no longer possessed before they had to start begging the North Koreans for weapons and using Iranian drones and all these other things, they most certainly could not do it now. I think it's also hyperbole to believe that the Ukrainians are going to completely crush the Russian military. Not because they don't have the will to fight, not because they're not brave enough, but because the size advantage is extraordinary. The Russians at the end of the day have an existing military industry that can produce weaponry. They're just a bigger country with a lot more people that they can conscript, they have more weight to bring. And they have more leverage on the international stage, primarily because they have a veto at the Security Council and they have nuclear weapons, the largest nuclear stockpile in the world. Another hyperbole is if we don't stop this now, next Russia will move against NATO. There isn't a single NATO country that Russia could defeat right now in a war. If they couldn't take Ukraine, they couldn't take Ukraine, who was not a member of NATO, who did not have a military that was well-resourced, whose territory that had already penetrated, whose intelligence services they had already deeply penetrated before this. If they couldn't do that and they can't do it now, how are they going to take any of these other countries? Leaving aside the NATO alliance for a moment, Russia's in no shape to invade or take anybody for a substantial period of time. Threaten? Yes. Maybe acts of sabotage, maybe, you know, destruction with agents or criminals that they hire? Yes. But invade and take a country, the Poles would crush them. The Lithuanians would destroy them. The Germans, any of these countries. It just, it's not, that's hyperbole. That's, what, that's what's next here. Hyperbole, in some cases I've heard this referred to almost like if we're living back in 1939 and the Nazi war machine is pushing forward into helpless countries. That's just, I, I get it. There's always a desire to live in a historic time and claim as some have here on this floor, this is a historic moment. The history of the world is going to be determined. No, this is important. This matters. This is a regional conflict with international repercussions that have a direct impact on our national security and our national interests. But it is nothing like the eve of World War II either. So it's important to have this balance. Now, the greatest geopolitical threat, challenge that we face today is the emerging rise of an axis, a very loose alliance, not even an alliance, a partnership between China, Russia, Iran, and then some other junior partners. And their number one interest of all these countries is to create a world or a world order that at a minimum is an alternative to the Western-led, US-led world order, at a minimum an alternative, but ideally a replacement. And while they have differences, the Iranians and the Russians have some differences. They both want to dominate Syria. They both, you know, they, 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 they have differences. The Chinese and the Russians have differences, historic and otherwise. The Russians do not like to be seen as the junior partner of the Chinese, but they are. The Chinese have long claimed that Siberia belongs to them. In fact, there's a lot of ethnic Chinese now living in Siberia. So they do have some differences, they have been able to somehow put that aside because they share a common goal that's important to their national interest, and that is they want a world in which the world order is favorable to them and unfavorable to us. 
one in which they have more influence and we have less influence. They want a world order in which the United States can no longer, and our allies, can no longer sanction Russia by denying them access to the banking system, because they've got their own banking system. They want a world in which the United States cannot threaten them with sanctions because there's alternatives to the dollar as the reserve currency. That's the world that they all want to live in. And so they are partnering on this. And what do they want to see in Ukraine? If you are sitting in Beijing right now, what do their policy leaders want? How do they view Ukraine? Or for that matter, how do they view what's happening in the Middle East? And here's how they view it. They view it as, we want America to be drained. We want America to be drained by the money and the attention they have to pour into Ukraine. We want America to be drained by the conflict that threatens to escalate in the Middle East. The Chinese want America to be drained in these two parts of the world because they know the more money we spend and the more attention we give to those parts of the world, the less money and the less attention we will have for the Indo-Pacific. By the way, it's one of the reasons why the Chinese get so annoyed at the North Koreans. Because every time the North Koreans launch rockets and give speeches about how they're going to blow something up and all these sorts of things and now partner with the Russians and therefore feel more confident in doing these things, they feel like it's more of an excuse for the U.S. to pay attention to the Indo-Pacific and deploy military assets to the region. So they want us to be drained. On the other hand, if we don't commit to these parts of the world, particularly Ukraine, then they're going to go around and tell everybody, you see, we told you. These Americans can't be counted on. They will abandon you. They will turn on you. So that's their goal. Either drain us, and if we pull out, hurt us. Collapse or undermine our alliances so that our allies in Europe will decide, listen, the Americans, we, we're not going to partner with you anymore. You can't be trusted. So the nations of the Middle East will no longer cooperate with us because we can't be trusted. We're unreliable. So the, Asian, the, so, so the nations in, the, in, in Asia and in the Indo-Pacific will cut the best deal they can with China because America can no longer be trusted. So that's their goal. Drain us or undermine us. So what is our goal? What should our goal be? Our goal should be to remain committed to helping Ukraine so that we're not seen as unreliable and undermined in our credibility but do it in a way that doesn't drain us. Do it in a way that does not distract us from our ability to focus on all these other parts of the world that are equally or more important in many cases. That, is our, that should be our strategy, to retain our credibility and the strength of our alliances through the commitments we've made in Ukraine, but without being drained. That's the kind of balancing act. By the way, I do want to say something, no matter, again, I. Of the people that will speak this evening, I may be the only one in support of helping Ukraine, and uh, at least at the level that I do it. Let me just remind everybody that no matter what, no matter what the House decides to do, this spending cannot be zero. And the reason why it cannot be zero is because 20 of the $60 billion is to buy our weapons for ourselves. That's what a lot of people don't realize. Part of the aid we've given Ukraine, we don't, it's not pallets of cash, it's, yes, we have rifles, we have guns, we have explosives, we have bombs, we have rockets, we have anti-aircraft capabilities in our stocks that we had for ourselves. And we gave it to them. We gave it to them to use. But now we don't have it. So we have to buy it. We have to restock what we gave them. That's 20 of the 60 billion. So at a minimum, it has to be 20 billion. Because otherwise, we remain vulnerable. Ultimately, people, that people want a strategy. Our, our, our strategic objective here is to be supportive of Ukraine, but not in a way that makes, it, that, makes it, that makes us incapable of being able to concentrate on the other parts and other matters that matter to us. As far as how this turns out, and you know, I've long resisted, though I've long believed this to be the case, I've long resisted talking about it in this way because I didn't want to undermine the position of Ukraine in any negotiated outcome. But ultimately, the conflict in Ukraine will end in a negotiated outcome. As I've already said, the Ukrainians are not going to wipe out the Russian military, and the Russians are not going to be able to conquer half of Ukraine. I think the Russians already fully understand that their objectives the day they invaded are out of reach. 
What the Russians want now is to negotiate a deal, the best deal they possibly can, holding on to as much Ukrainian land as they can get their hands on, and to force and compel the neutrality of Ukraine. In essence, what the Russians want at this point is to, is to have enough military success so they can gain a little bit more territory, but also force any future Ukrainian government to be neutral, not to be a member of NATO, not to be allied with the West. That is the Russian goal. And so in any negotiation, it's about leverage. Negotiation is about leverage. Who has the most leverage? Who has the most to give and who, ha who, who is in the most desperate need of a deal? And so part of the reason why we should not abandon Ukraine and give them nothing is because we want them to have the strongest possible negotiating leverage. If we cut all of Ukraine's money and just said, we're done with Ukraine, we're finished, Ukraine would have no leverage. Russia would have all the leverage. The Russians would then be able to negotiate a deal that could very much leave us with a Ukraine that looks like Belarus, with a government, a puppet government, and with Russia holding significant land. And then multiple countries around the world are going to see that as an example of what they could get away with in their regional conflict. And that will matter. As I've already explained, that's the, that will have an impact on us as a country. So that needs to be our goal. We can't stop the help. We want to give them enough help so that they have the strongest possible hand in a negotiated settlement at some point. But here's my problem with what we're going to be voting on here in a few hours. As important as all of this is, as important as what's happened in the invasion of, the Ukraine, of Ukraine is, our country is facing an invasion too. If I walked out these doors, tomorrow most of the people here will get on airplanes and fly home in the morning after what time, whatever time the vote is here. You re-enter the normal world outside the bubble of this place. And the overwhelming, I don't have to take a poll. The overwhelming majority of people would say, okay, I don't have anything against Ukraine. I actually hope Ukraine wins. I don't like Putin. I get everything you just said about our national interest. But how can we focus on that? And not at least also focus on what's happening to us in our country at our southern border. Because it makes no sense to people. And it's not just isolated to this instance. When was the last time the Senate met over a weekend, Super Bowl weekend of all things, for hours and hours and hours, basically said we're going to stay here till we get it done because it's that important, other than funding the government? When is the last time that you saw Congress and the Senate spend that much time working on something that matters directly, a priority of the American people? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. If I were to summarize what most people are out there are going to say, they're going to say, well, hold on a second. How could we be so focused on an invasion of another country and do nothing about the invasion of ours? And that's what we face at the southern border. There's no other way to describe it. I'll address some of the points that will be raised in response to what I just said, anticipating what though, because they've already been made. The first is there was a bill, a bipartisan negotiated bill, and you rejected it. Well, first of all, I didn't negotiate it. I didn't even know what was in it until the Sunday that it was released a week ago yesterday. And there were some things in it that I think are positive, but for generally I rejected it because when I took the sum of it and I read its details, and I've already details, I won't spend all time here tonight discussing all the problems I had with it, I actually am convinced, beyond any doubt in my mind, that had we passed that legislation, yes, we would have gotten some improvements on asylum language, which is something we should do, but it had other provisions that actually made things worse in the long term. One that I continue to point to, is that we were going to have, in this country, thousands of new asylum agents, basically, who would have the power at the border to either, A, give someone an immediate work permit. Today, even if you ask for asylum, you've got to wait six months to get a work permit. This would give them a, a, a work permit on the spot. That would be an enormous magnet for more people to come. You mean I can come to the U.S., say the magic words, and I get a work permit right away? You're going to see the numbers spike. But here's the other thing these asylum agents would have the power to do. 
These asylum agents will now have the power to give them asylum right there and then. And it would be more efficient. It's not like asylum. Yes, two differences between that and the process today. The first is the process today would be an asylum judge. And that's taking a very long time. Those agents would make things more efficient, but it wouldn't make it better. It would actually incentivize more flow. Now people realize, hey, we could get in and we might actually have a pretty substantial chance, say it's 30 or 40 percent, of being given a work permit or asylum right there on the spot. And once you have asylum, most people don't realize this, once you have asylum, it is basically the equivalent of a green card. Once you are given asylum, you are five years away from being a citizen which is what many people on the other side of this aisle want. It's what many Democratic activists openly want. They want more citizens who are grateful because they know which party are the ones that gave them asylum and citizenship because they'll become voters for them. That provision alone would increase the number of people coming to this country. Today they come knowing they'll be released, they'll have to wait six months to get a work permit, and at some point, they're going to have to show up for an asylum hearing. Now, they'll come knowing we, might, we have a real chance not just to get released, but to get an immediate work permit and maybe even granted asylum on the spot. That would not make our system better. It would make it worse. So that alone was a reason why I could not support that deal. But I want to be clear. When people go around saying, we gave you exactly what you wanted, and they turned it down. They're not serious about border security. You did not give me what I wanted. I can't speak for anybody else. I don't know what other people told you they wanted. I never even said I wanted a bill. I said I wanted the president to reverse the executive orders that he issued that created the migratory crisis that we now face, that created this invasion. Let me show you something in this graph, something I really wanted to point to. This, put my pen there. This is the year, this is the land encounters by month heading into the year, at the end of the fiscal year 20. This is January of 2021. This point right here is the election of Joe Biden. Just look at this graph. From the moment he was elected in January, look at the spike and the spike. What happened? What happened between here and here? And moving forward, I don't have a big enough uh, board to show you what's happened in the last years, but just explain to me this, this spike right there. What happened there? Because something happened there. Look at the line here was flat. And if I went back further, you'd see the line was flat, flat. It's actually a little down this way. What happened here at this moment in time that things shot up? Because if this was an EKG or some medical test, doctors would point to that and say, something happened here, man. Something happened. Look at this jump. I'll tell you what happened here. A lot of things happened there. On his first day in office, Biden gets elected. He issues a 100-day moratorium on deportations. We're not deporting anyone for 100 days. First of all, throughout this time, he campaigned for president. And the whole world heard him say, I'm going to get rid of all the Trump policies. So already, people that want to come into our country are just waiting for the election to go. I said this the other day when I gave a speech. When I talk to you about these issues, this is not something that I picked up on from some briefing or some document I read or some experts they came in. I get this from the people that actually came because a lot of them live in Miami and their relatives live in Miami. And their, and, and their decisions about coming to the United States illegally, it is not built on legal interpretations of the law. Most of them don't even know what our immigration laws are. Many of them misunderstand our immigration laws. They come based on what they believe our policies are. And you have traffickers that are telling them things that aren't true, but you also have perception. And the perception was Trump was restrictive. Trump did, did everything to stop people from coming. Biden is going to do the opposite. He gets elected. That leads to a spike, just his election did. But not just his election, his policies. Something else happened in that period of time. Joe Biden became the first president in the modern history of our country that decided we would not detain virtually anyone who came into this country unlawfully. People love to say immigration law is so complicated, so difficult, so hard to understand. It is. It, it, it's, it's, it's complex, certainly to practice. But at its core, it's pretty straightforward. Here's what the law says, and I'm, again, paraphrasing. It says, here are the people who are allowed to come into the United States. 
And if anyone who comes into the United States is not supposed to be here, you are to detain them until removal. Bottom line, you're either allowed to enter the country or you're not. And if you're not and you enter illegally, they're supposed to detain you until they remove you. Now, there have always been exceptions. And there are some very narrow exceptions that have always been applied on a case-by-case -case basis by every president. Obama applied it that way. And those exceptions for humanitarian concerns and things of this nature were designed for individual cases. So a well-known you know, figure in China or in some other part of the world shows up at, 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 and, and everybody knows who they are and they're being oppressed, they let them in, humanitarian. Person is dying, if you send them back, they may die on the flight home, you let them in. There's always been that exception. Biden made the exception the rule. He basically decided it is inhumane to detain anyone. And so we're going to release virtually everyone, 85%, sometimes 90 in some months. And so people realize very quickly, forget about the law, forget about the particulars of the law, people realize very quickly, if I can get to the border and I turn myself over to a border agent, my chances of being released into the country are 85% or higher. And they know it because they know people that did it. This is how this works. I have literally had people come up to me and show me, look at what I zelled. Look at the cash out payment that I made to some guy. It cost me five grand or 10 grand to get my family over here so they, could go, so they could come in. I paid them to bring them in. They showed it to me. And I asked them, well, how did you know about this? I said, well, because I know other people that did it. Somebody comes illegally, they turn themselves in, they're released, they're turned over to a non-government organization, a charity, and that charity tells you all the benefits you qualify for, depending on the jurisdiction they send you to. They may even give you a plane ticket or a bus ticket. They make it to wherever they're going, and they call home and they tell everybody, here's how I did it, here's how I came, and more people come behind them and follow them. So this spike is easy to understand. Joe Biden changed the way we enforce immigration law through executive orders. He basically announced, we're not going to enforce immigration law. We're going to release everyone. And people figured it out. And they started coming. And the invasion began. That's what created the problem, not a law. The law is the same. The law today is the same as it was that day right there. The law today, immigration law in America, is identical. Our immigration statutes are identical today to what they were on this day, on this day, all those other years. The numbers don't lie. Forget, put aside the graph for a moment. In his first full month in office, 101, almost 102,000 people were encountered at the border. Just in his first month in office, that's double the highest number of monthly encounters in the last year of the Trump presidency. Doubled in his first month. None of these other excuses people come up with, the end of COVID, climate change. The climate changed that much in one month to the next? What changed was a new president who said, come, we want you to come, we'll release you. The year 21, from here forward, it ended with over 1.7 million total encounters at the southern border. During that 12-month period in 2021, of that fiscal year, the highest month was over 213,000 encounters at the border. And you look at the last year of the Trump presidency, there were 458,000 encounters at the southern border. It went from 458 in the last year of the Trump presidency to 1.7 million in the first year of the Biden presidency under the same immigration law. The immigration law did not change. What changed was the president and his policies. And that's what created this crisis. And that's how you fix it. Now, obviously, the president doesn't want to fix it, doesn't want to change it. There's reasons why he doesn't want to change it. The first is it would be admitting Trump was right. To change it back to what those policies were is basically to admit Trump was right about immigration. And the things he did made sense. And he obviously doesn't want to do that. The second reason why he can't change it is because he has an activist base in his party that'll go completely bonkers. He has an activist base in his party that believes that we should have borderless countries, 
that believe that people should be allowed to live wherever they want. I'm not telling you it's a majority. I'm not telling you it's 30%. But it's a, it's a big and powerful activist base who will protest and heckle and threaten to vote against you because they believe that humans have a right to live in any country in the world they want. They should be able to migrate anywhere they want. They admit it openly. I've heard him say it to my face. And so he won't do it because of them either. But that's what will fix it. Reverse the policies that happened right in this period of time. That's what would have fixed it. That's what I asked for. That's what I asked for. I didn't do it. So I can't speak for anybody else. But don't tell me that you gave us what I wanted on the border. You did not. I didn't ask you for a law. The, the, law, the law can be improved. But the law is not the reason why we got that spike. As I told you, the law is the same here as it is here. What changed was those policies. And what will change that back is to go back to some of those policies. For Biden to use executive orders to repeal the executive orders that he put in place that created this crisis. Now, this is where people tell me, well, why can't we do both? America can help Ukraine and can also deal with the border. I agree with that. Not only can we do it, we should do it. My problem with this bill is it doesn't do it. It only does one of the two things. The choice we were given was, here is this fake immigration enforcement. We're going to call it immigration enforcement, but it's not really immigration enforcement. Here's this fake immigration enforcement bill. And here's Ukraine money, which is real money. And if you don't take it, then we're going to say that you voted against border security and we get what we want. They get what they want. What they want is to be able to not do anything on the border and be able to blame Republicans for it. It's a political ploy. And that's what we're faced here today. The problem I have with this bill, as I said, is we're not doing both. If we were getting from the president real changes in his border policies to bring this under control, we might not even be here tonight. We might have gotten this done already. And I'd have been supportive. But we don't. The other thing you'll hear people say is now you're holding Ukraine hostage. You're holding up the important Ukraine hostage over our border. Well, I'd say a couple things about that. First is, um, you're holding Israel hostage over Ukraine. If you put an Israel aid vote bill on the floor right now, if you put a bill on this floor right now that said Taiwan and Israel aid, it would probably pass with 89, 90 votes. But they didn't. They held it hostage until they got Ukraine. So they say we're holding the Ukraine hostage over the border. They're holding Israel hostage over Ukraine. And they've held Israel hostage over Ukraine. And so you're now faced with a bill that says, you want to help Israel? You got to do what we want on Ukraine and you get nothing on the border. But they're the ones holding hostage. The other argument I've heard is, well, these are just people that are against helping Ukraine, and they're just using this as an excuse to kill the bill. I've already explained to you, that's not me. You might be referring to other people, but not me. What I wanted us to do is what I've said. I wanted us to do something real about our national security, about our invasion, about our border. Is it leverage? Yes. In this process, in this place, this is the only way you sometimes get things done. The only way you get things done is by holding up something that you might support but the other side really wants in exchange for something that you want. And in this case, there is no shame in telling you that, yes, it was used as leverage, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. I have no shame in saying that because the leverage of what I was asking for is what our people need, what our country needs. It's a priority for our country. It's important for our country. What good are we to Ukraine? What good is America to NATO? What good is America to the Indo-Pacific? What good are we as a nation now and in the years to come to any other nation on Earth if we can't even take care of our own problems here at home? And this is a problem. This is not a small matter. This is not a seasonal ebb and flow. This is not a transitory issue. This migration, this invasion of the United States is going to get worse, not better. 
It's going to get worse in terms of numbers, and it's going to get worse in terms of severity inside of our country. It already is creating a problem. Number one, we're being overrun. Not by a few thousand people, by over three and a half million people that have been released into this country that we know about, 600,000 of whom either have criminal records or pending criminal matters. You think you're going to, and, and, don't, and they'll tell you, oh, we know who a lot of these people are. They don't even interview some of these people. But even if they did, they don't know who these people are. Because I know enough about that part of the world to tell you, you can buy fake documents from over a dozen countries in the Western Hemisphere. Where if you have enough money on you, you can go somewhere and get an official government document that says your name is Jose Alvarez or Raul Sanchez or whatever you want your name to be. And then you show up at the board and that's who we think you are. We have no idea who some of these people are. We have no idea if they have criminal records. You think the Venezuelan authorities are producing their criminal records and biometrics to us? You think the Cuban authorities are doing that? You think people coming from Africa, people coming from all over the world, that those places are actually providing that for us? The only thing we can tell you is, are you in our terrorist database? There are a lot of terrorists that are not in the database until they commit terror acts. And assuming they survive it, you get your hands on them. We have no idea who these people are. People say, well, but most of them are probably good people here, hard work. I'm sure. But that's not the point. The point is you let in three, four, five million people. Some percentage of them are going to be bad. Some percentage of them are going to be criminals. I don't care where they came from. You take a million people from anywhere in the world at any time, some percentage of that million are going to turn out to be bad people at some point and do harm. And you're already seeing it. We have a migrant crime wave going on in New York and in other major cities. They're not committing crimes because they're migrants. They're committing crimes because they're criminals. They were criminals in their own country. You think these people just got here the other day and learned how to pickpocket? You think that 15-year-old that fired at a police officer? I don't know if you heard this story. A 15-year-old went in to shoplift, confronted by a security officer, pulls out a gun, tries to kill a police officer, a block away, fires the gun again. They arrest him. Another roving gang attacked a police officer, uh, two police officers at a train station. And that's just, the, those are the ones you've heard about. It's a crime wave. And it's going to get worse. The Venezuelan community in South Florida has been telling me for the better part of a year that what was coming now are gang members. And I didn't know how to judge their claim or what they were saying. Now I see they were right. They were right. Some of them didn't come straight from Venezuela. They left Venezuela, and they were committing crimes in Peru. They were committing crimes in Brazil. They were committing crimes in Colombia. And when they realized they could come to America, where you can steal even more. They saw their opportunity because Biden said, if you come, we'll release you. They came. Now we have a crime wave, and it's only going to get worse. Now we have cities. I saw the mayor of Denver the other day crying, you know, and complaining. He wants more money. It's a sanctuary city. These are places that pass laws that basically said, if you come here and you're here illegally, don't worry, we're going to protect you. We're not going to arrest you. We're not going to ask questions. If you are arrested, we're not going to deport you. We're going to give you stuff and benefits. So, of course, people go there. They go there, and it costs them money. You got, now you've got to close your schools. You've got to spend money on migrant shelters. You've got to spend money on your, all these things. And now they're complaining about it. You were very proud to be a sanctuary community. And now, in this bill that they tried to get us to pass, we were going to send them hundreds of millions of dollars to bail them out for being sanctuary cities. Meanwhile, they're not spending that money on the homeless, homeless Americans that live in their community. They're taking that money out of services from the taxpayers of those communities. So people go to work, they work hard, they pay their taxes, and their money's taken and given to people that came into our country illegally. And what about terrorism? I want to be careful because I don't want to say anything that, or divulge anything. Let me just say it this way. And I said this earlier before, so just use common sense. Do you think that terrorists around the world, you think ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah, you think they are completely unaware of this? You think those guys don't know that the most effective trafficking organizations in the history of mankind is operating off our southern border? You don't think they know that? And you don't think they're tapped into that? And you don't think that they would push terrorists into this country that way? 
Well, I think common sense tells you they would. In the time remaining, I want to briefly talk about Israel because it's part of this bill as well. You know, it's interesting the last couple of days this freak out over something that Trump said about NATO. I was running around freaking out, oh my God, he's going to get us out of NATO. They forget Trump was already president once and he didn't pull us out. And in fact, he deployed extra troops to Poland. We increased our troop presence in Poland because pro Poland was contributing towards NATO. But put that aside for a moment. Because this whole notion of this theoretical Russia is going to invade countries because Trump is going to encourage them, all these people on television with all the silliness. Well, Israel's in a war right now. Israel's in a war right now, an existential war. Israel's enemies right now want to destroy Israel. They don't want to harm Israel. They don't want to defeat Israel military. They want to destroy Israel. They are in a war right now. And we have a president that's undermining Israel. Undermining. You say no. Okay. Here's the stuff we're now reading. I just want to go off this article from NBC, which is a, as, you know, NBC, one of the most well-known conservative outlets in America. Right? This is from them. President Joe Biden has been venting his frustration in private conversations with campaign donors over his inability to persuade Israel to change its military tactics in Gaza. He's been trying to get Israel to agree to a ceasefire, but Netanyahu is, quote, giving him hell. Netanyahu, quote, is impossible to deal with. He feels like this is enough, one of the people said of his views expressed by Biden. It has to stop. In some of his private conversations, his descriptions of dealing with Netanyahu are peppered with contemptuous references to Netanyahu as this guy. In at least three recent instances, Netanyahu referred, Biden called Netanyahu an A something. I can't say it on the Senate floor, according to two, three people directly familiar with his comments. It goes on. He's grown steadily more frustrated with the rising Palestinian civilian death toll in Gaza. He took a sharper tone on Thursday, described Israel's military assault in Gaza as over the top. So I guess this bill is funding Israel's over the top effort to defeat an a, a, a terrorist group that didn't just massacre over a thousand Israelis, but his organizing principles, the destruction of the Jewish state. Uh, frustrations with Netanyahu have also not led to major policy shift, but his administration has begun to consider such options. Two weeks ago, officials told NBC News that the administration was discussing delaying or slowing U.S. weapon sales to Israel as leverage to get Netanyahu to dial down Israel, Israeli military operations in Gaza. As leverage. So you're going to vote for a bill to give money to Israel so Biden can use it as leverage against our ally, Israel. This is an ally involved in a war right now. Not theoretical, not a campaign speech, right now. You're worried about undermining NATO, worry about undermining our ally, Israel, in a war right now, a real war. And I, you know, the, the, it goes on. I mean, I could go on forever. They're drafting options for formally recognizing an independent Palestinian state, the so-called two-state solution. How are you going to reach, that's, that's the ideal outcome in a perfect world, in the real world. How are you going to have a two-state solution with a group, groups, whose goal is a one-state solution? The Palestinian or, uh, organizations, the PLO and, and, and uh, Authority in, in the West Bank and, in, and uh, Hamas and Gaza, they don't have a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution. Their one-state solution is that from the river to the sea, there not be a single Jew. That's their solution. And you want to give them their own territory where they can launch more attacks to achieve this goal. I could go on, but all of this, how does this wind up in the press? This is a strategic leak. They put this out there to message their activist base because there is an activist base within the Democratic coalition that is threatening to vote against Biden. We've seen these reports. That's why he sent the White House aides to go meet with anti-Semites, pro-Hamas, pro-Hezbollah activists in Michigan last week, people that claim that our government is controlled by Jewish money. That's who they met with. These are the people that are disrupting his speeches, calling him Genocide Joe. That's who he met with. And this is designed to try to appease them because they're threatening to vote against them. That's undermining an ally. That's happening real time right now. And all this talk about ceasefire. We can't have a ceasefire. Let me tell you how we can have a ceasefire. Hamas can surrender its weapons and it can release its hostages. But they won't. Hamas doesn't care how many Palestinian civilians die. In fact, they deliberately 
deliberately position military targets next to civilians so that civilians get killed. They want civilians to be killed. They steal the aid money. Has anyone wondered how much does it cost to build the tunnels that they have built under the ground in Gaza? Millions of dollars spent building tunnels, not building hospitals, not building schools, not building industries, not creating jobs for, for the people of Gaza, tunnels for their terrorists so they could hide hostages, so they could hide weapons, so they can infiltrate and kill Jews in Israel. That's what they spend their money on. We're going to send them more of that money when this bill passes. That's what you're voting for. It's in there. Look, it just this is part of a broader problem here. People have to be watching this and saying, these people are completely out of touch with our priorities. They've abandoned all common sense. The list of things that, the, that, that prove this are extraordinary. One of the things I see a lot in South Florida are people that have been in this country, they maybe came from Cuba 45 years ago. They've worked here their entire lives. They retire. They get $800, $900, $1,000 a month from Social Security. And then they run into somebody who just got here from Cuba three months ago, 29 years old, doesn't work, and is given $1,500 a month in benefits by our government because they're refugees. That refugee, a year later, is traveling back to Cuba 15 times. So you're a refugee fleeing oppression from a place that you now go back and visit 15 times the following year. And in the meantime, we're giving you Medicaid, food stamps, uh, health care for your children, cash payments from the refugee fund. So imagine if you've been working here for 40 years and your social security check is smaller than the benefits going to a 28-year-old, able-bodied person who just got here. That's real. That happens. That's happening every day. That makes no sense. How about this one? Biden has issued a visa ban and sanctions against Israeli settlers. Where's the visa ban and sanctions on Hamas supporters who are here on student visas? We would never have given them the visa if they were Hamas supporters, but now that they're here, they can go up and down the street calling for intifada, saying anti-Semitic stuff, tearing down posters. We haven't taken away a single student visa or any other visitor visa. Go after the Israeli settlers, but not after the Hamas terrorists and Hamas terrorism supporters in our own country. That's happening. When the horrible events of January 6th happened, within hours, we had fences, the tallest fences you've ever seen, barbed wire, National Guard from multiple states. We had more National Guards people here than we had members of Congress, five to one. Great people, sleeping in, in the kitchen, sleeping in the dining room. This place was protected. When a state decides we're going to build a fence and deploy the National Guard to protect our state and our sovereignty, let's go to the Supreme Court and force them to tear it down. So you'll build a fence and flood this place with National Guard to protect yourself in this capital, but you won't do it to protect our country. That makes no sense to people. That makes no sense. How about this? You know the leverage that Russia, you know why Russia, one of the reasons why they invaded Ukraine? Because they believed that Europe was so dependent on them for natural gas, they wouldn't do anything about it. And so it, Europe is doing something about it. And the US says, and we will export our natural gas surpluses to you. So you don't have to depend on the Russians. And what does this administration do? They suspend LNG exports a couple weeks ago because a handful of TikTok influencers demanded it because of the climate. That makes no sense. But they did it. On issue after issue, we either have lost all common sense or we are consistently ignoring the needs of everyday hardworking Americans and putting something or someone above them over and over and over again. And that's why people lose faith in institutions. That's why they lose faith in leaders. That's why they lose faith in our process. That's what leads to populism. In the history of the world, you look at it over and over again, when people believe that their needs, their legitimate needs, are being ignored by the people who run the government, in the modern history, they have gone in one of two directions, and they are both toxic. One is socialism, the promise of the victim against the oppressor, and government's going to fix it all by controlling the economy and your lives, and the other direction they go 
is ethnic nationalism. The argument that all this is happening because somebody of another race, another color, another religion, they're to blame. One of your fellow countrymen are to blame. That's the danger in all of this. And that's why it's always so important that in a republic, a republic is capable of understanding and responding to the needs of people. And in our country, it's a people that for the better part of 25 or 30 years, we're told, it doesn't matter that we're going to send our factories and our jobs halfway around the world to another country. Don't worry. You're going to learn how to code. And you're going to find a new job making a lot more money. Well, they never got to learn how to code. And they never found a better job. And they gutted our cities and communities and took them apart. They're tired of being put in second place. And it's happened too often. And it's happening here again now. And that's why I'm not going to support this bill, because it violates our most important responsibility, and that is to give voice to the people of this country and stop putting them in second place behind everything and everyone else. I yield the floor.